So that's what we are going to talk about. So I uh, showed you some of the interesting things that can happen in dense stellar systems. Um, there will be some more coming that's uh, more cutting edge uh, on the last lecture. Um, but in the, in the next, with this one and the next two lectures, what I am uh, going to do is uh, talk to you about why this gravitational n-body problem is uh, a very unique problem. There is, uh, you, you cannot really directly relate it to any other type of uh, problems. And uh, then we will uh, talk about the formalism that has been developed to solve these kinds of problems. Okay. Um, so, and another thing um, that I will follow is, uh, so there is uh, no real way for me to really understand how much uh, you're following. Maybe I'm not explaining things well. Uh, or going too fast or going too slow. So, uh, if you, so every now and then when uh, I am a little uh, nervous that maybe I'm not being clear enough, I'll ask you questions. If you can answer, if sev several hands are raised, then I will assume that, okay, this, uh, this was clear. Um, if you don't answer, then I will try to slow down and try to explain more. So if you're getting bored, the way to not be bored is uh, when I ask questions, answer them. Okay. Um, and in general, if you don't understand something, stop me. Okay. Um, so let's start with something that I think all of you know. Um, so all of you have seen Newtonian equations of motion. Right? All of you know how masses attract each other through the gravitational constant T. Um, why is it that the uh, universe mostly is governed by gravity? Gravity is a very weak force, right? Uh, compared to other forces, except electroweak. Uh, why is gravity so important? This is where, if you don't want me to slow down, you need to raise your hands and ask, answer questions. Right. So um, the answer is, uh, since gravity is so weak, um, every other forces that might have, every other long-range forces uh, that uh, might have been important had been important and done their things. So gravity is the only thing that is left out. And since it's one of the mo weakest large-range forces, that's the one that governs the motions in the universe. Okay? And the way to formalize this is through coupling constants. Everyone have heard about coupling constants? So, okay. So I will not talk about that. So, there are, it's a gravitational in-body problem is kind of weird uh, in the sense that if you uh, are only interested in Newtonian gravity, gravity then how, what's the maximum n you can exactly solve? Okay. Uh, for three, there are specific restrictive problems that you can uh, solve through perturbation theories. Uh, interestingly, um, if you use Einstein's gravity, the exact thing you can do is n equals one. If you go to quantum chromodynamics, it's hard to solve the vacuum. So, just a joke. Um, so, but I have told you that these clusters are um, a million uh, stars that are all interacting with each other, right? So, can, so what are the other kinds of problems that where you have seen very large N? 
gases. So thermodynamics would be one example. Um, what's the difference between, uh, say, ideal gas and gravity? How so? Right, so a, uh, typically ideal gas, we don't uh, uh, take into account self-gravity. Uh, and in that case, the, it, it, the, the particles are not really interacting on large scale. Only when they come very close to each other, uh, they bounce or collide and it's a short range force. And because gravity is a large range force, it has uh, several uh, strangenesses. So let's talk about some of the strangenesses. Um, so gravity has negative heat capacity. So this is actually true for any bound system, but uh, for gravity it becomes uh, particularly problematic. So if you, okay, let's, I will start writing it down from here because I think the reflection is not too bad here. So if you don't see it from that corner, let me know. You can see this? And you can read my handwriting. So let's consider two masses. So this is likely you have all seen. So let's call them M1 and M2. And they are separated by some distance vector r. So the force equation looks like this. This is equal to the centripetal force. That is m2 v square over r. So I'm not worrying too much about both things are moving, reduced mass, center of mass, right? Um, so from this, you can write down that v square is g m1 over r, right? So the kinetic energy is half m2 v squared equals g m1 m2 over 2r, right? And if you remember what is the potential energy of the system, that is minus g m1 m2 over r. This is just the divergence of the force, right? So the total energy is this, right? That is this. Okay. So you know that this will have to be negative because this is a bound system. And you also see that this is half of the potential energy. Okay. So now, okay, let's call that E. And we also know that this is negative of the kinetic energy. Yes. So, if you take a derivative of this, dE dt is minus d kinetic energy dt. Okay. So, if you increase energy, kinetic energy decreases, okay? So what are the consequences for this? 
So any kinetic energy is uh, motion, right? So anything that is moving faster, if it interacts with something else, it can give kinetic energy to the other thing that was initially static. So this is the same as in idle gas. So something that's moving can knock another particle, and then it moves. So in, in context of, the th on, of thermodynamics, this is called thermalization of system. Okay? So you can imagine that for any given distribution of velocities, it has a, um, an equivalent temperature. So the distribution will be something like a Maxwellian, and that would be equivalent to some kind of KT prescription in thermodynamics. Okay. So in other words, uh, anything that has higher velocity distributions is at a higher temperature. Okay. So anything that's at a higher temperature gives energy to anything that's at a lower temperature. So if something is at a higher temperature, giving energy, then this is going down, right, by giving energy. But as a result, kinetic energy goes up. Kinetic energy going up means velocity is going up. So as velocity goes up, temperature goes up. So this becomes a, a runaway process. So the more energy you extract from something that's moving faster under self-gravity, the more it can give energy, right? Um, can anyone give an, a day-to-day -day example of something like this? Well, not quite day-to-day, -day, but... Uh, Something you've probably heard of. In spiraling orbits of satellites. So as the satellites uh, move around Earth, if it encounters any kind of drag through from the atmosphere, it starts in spiraling, and as it inspirals, it moves faster. So it's kind of weird uh, in a sense, because normally, you expect when you extract energy from something, the temperature should go down. That's the typical positive heat capacity. But in the gravi self-gravitating system, it's the opposite. It's negative heat capacity. And that can create all kinds of uh, strange situations. Okay. What's the other strangeness in gravity? So let's, uh, let's just keep this in mind, and I will erase this part. Actually, I will erase later. Um, let's think about what really matters um, in changing the motion of any massive object as a result of some distribution of mass that it encounters. Okay? So let's consider some mass M is moving in some kind of field. So this is, you can imagine that this is some uniform density of mass in some side of it. So let's consider influence of this mass distribution on this mass as a function of radius. So let's take a shell at some distance r, and this is, say, delta r. Okay? And for simplicity, let's call the density to be uniform in rho. Okay. So the force is gm times delta m over r square in the direction, so I'm suppressing the direction because it's all pointing 
connecting the, the two. And this essentially is g m rho 4 pi r square delta r over r square. r square drops out and it becomes g m rho delta r. So what's interesting is the force from this shell at some distance r does not depend on r anymore. So that means this mass is getting affected by this shell the same way as some other shell and so on. But now as you increase r in the same solid angle, you have a, and the, the, this is happening because uh, in the same solid angle, you have a larger area. So you can have more stars. And the combined, combined effect becomes independent of r. Okay. And another way to think about this is if you want to find out um, influence of this mass distribution for shells that have equal delta R over R, so equal fractional width, then this actually becomes proportional to R. If you take equal fractional steps away from any star in a distribution, Stars that are more distant becomes more important in influencing the motion of the star. So this is completely opposite of any kind of thermodynamics problems. Uh, there the problem is much simpler. Only, you need to only take into account particles that are coming close enough to it to influence its motion. Otherwise, it's just doing so these two things are very unique to gravitational uh, fields, and that creates all, uh, all the necessi uh, necessary adjustments in the formalism to understand the, how a particular star, or stars in general, will move in a potential created by other stars, or in general self-gravitating systems. So we are now interested in uh, finding out how a star will move in a potential of other stars, okay? And from this, we know that whatever change in its motion happens, it, it's dominated by stars that are typically much larger in distance. So typically, the influence from each individual star is tiny. Another way to think about it is uh, there is more volume as you keep increasing the radius. So there are more stars, although it's a tiny influence. Uh, collectively, it's the same, but you need to uh, take into account more tiny influences than a strong scattering that's happening very near. Okay. So now we are, let me separate the areas. Now we want to understand uh, how the star will move in a self-gravitating field so let's think that this is a star, and it's in some field created by the other stars. And one way to think about it is, so the, the star is looking at some potential that is coming from some large N, so there will be a smooth part of it. 
So as, as if, although the potential is created by discrete stars, since most of them are at very large distances, uh, you can imagine that together it's a mean field, and all this star is sensitive about is the motion in the mean field. Okay. On top of that, as the star moves in the field, occasionally it comes close enough to a star that it, this, the star in question recognizes it to be a star that is separate from the field. So in other way to think about it is the, the, the distance during closest approach between the two stars become so important that there is a deflection in its normal velocity in the smooth potential. So let's calculate anything, any self-gravitating system. So um, most generally, I am talking about a distribution of massive objects uh, moving in the field created by them. Okay. So in one way, um, the basic problem is there is some inherent potential, but the motion will be governed by the potential and some occasional deflections due to discreteness of the potential. So let's, so we all know uh, how a star moves in some smooth potential. You just take a divergence of a uh, position-dependent field, and that gives you force, and you can write down the equations of motion. So let's not worry about it. Let's only worry about what happens when there is a deflection and how to calculate that. So now this is the star we uh, are interested about. Let's say that in the smooth potential, it is moving with some velocity v0. Okay. And along its path, there is another mass. Let's again call them m1 and m2. And let's go to the center of mass frame. So these are things that we have probably seen before. So if M1 is going moving with V1, so this is in general. So forget about this picture for a second. M2 moving with X2 and V2. So this, by the way, uh, is uh, often called the n-body picture. So you have some mass and uh, positions and velocities. So it could, so this, uh, although I'm writing it as positions and velocities, later on we will see that any uh, combination of canonical coordinate systems can uniquely uh, describe the motion of uh, these kind of particles. So if you want to write down the equations of motion, you go to the center of mass frame, and you can write it down as m1, m2 over m1 plus m2. Right? R is the vector connecting the two masses. And this is the used mass, this quantity. Let's just write it down.
you have all seen this, right? So essentially, what you were uh, doing here is in the center of mass frame, motion, uh, the, the change of the, uh, the position connector is governed by, uh, governed the, in the same way as if at the center of mass, you have the total mass of the system and the reduced mass is moving around that system. Right? And based on this, you can write down some identities. Uh, these are actually the definition of center of mass. So we know that um, R is x1 minus x2. So V dot is R dot is, sorry, V is R dot is x1 dot minus x2 dot, right? So this is essentially, so in, in a problem like this, it's, it's an imp, uh, impact type problem. So there is no force acting at large negative times or large positive times. And the force is acting only for a limited amount of time. So you can write it down as V1 minus delta V2. So these are coming just from the definitions. And then if you want to understand the change in velocity of a particular star, then you can write it down. So let's make it general. Vj is mi over mi plus mj times delta v of the center of mass. These are all coming from the definitions of these quantities. Everyone is satisfied with this? So let me just erase this now. Let's look at the deflection problem. So there is a symmetry in this problem, right? So when M1 was far from M2, there was no force acting on it. And after the force acts, it moves away, and there is no force acting on it again. So if you draw the trajectory, it will be something that's symmetric across the time when they do the closest approach. Okay? Let's say. This is what happens. Let's say that the, sorry, this, this shouldn't be carved. This should be a straight line because no force is acting on it at t equals infinity. Let's say that this is the deflection angle. And let's think in the center of mass frame. So essentially, you don't have m1 and m2. You have the total mass here. And let's connect, let's draw a parallel line this way, let's call it B. We'll keep coming back to this quantity, this quantity is called impact parameter. And then let's define some angle Let's call it psi zero. So that is the angle between this line and whatever the point is for closest approach. And let's say that the connecting vector 
makes an angle psi at any given point of time. Okay. Now let's think of some conserved quantities. So angular momentum is one of the conserved quantities in Kepler, Kepler motion. So this is a generalized form of Keplerian motion. So it's moving under the same inverse square law gravity, uh, but it is an unbound system. So if you have seen the conic section formalism of solving Keplerian motion, you probably have seen this problem already. Um, essentially, in terms of uh, bound Keplerian motion, and uh, this would be a hyperbolic orbit with eccentricity positive. Okay. Or, sorry, greater than one. Um, but angular momentum is conserved. And at t equals minus infinity, angular momentum is essentially v0. So this is V0 in a direction perpendicular to B. So angular momentum is just B V0. Let's just keep that in mind. Yeah. Hmm? What mass? Yes. Oh, sorry, in unit mass. Uh, let's call it small l. Uh, angular momentum per mass, per unit mass. Mass is not changing, so no point carrying it over. So let's write down the equations of motion. Can you see this? Okay. So it's nothing but the equation of the conic section. So you probably have seen this as uh, some phase term. And then this is essentially gm over L square. Okay. Hmm? This is solution of Kepler's motion, yes. Actually, this is, this is the equation uh, that tells you that the solution of this would be uh, conic sections for different constants. And in uh, bound Kepler's motion, I think this constant becomes eccentricity. Okay? So um, we have two constants. Uh, that depends on the initial condition. Psi zero, remember, is the angle at closest approach. Okay. So the way to solve that, uh, we need uh, two different equations. So another equation we can get is from uh, the velocities. So this would be uh, C R square psi dot sine all of these are constants so they drop away and this by definition is angular momentum per unit mass r square psi dot and we know that is conserved 
So we can write this down as C B V naught sine right. Everyone happy with it? Good? Okay, now let's put some boundary values. So at t equals infinity, psi is zero. So if we put that in here, so from this equation, t equals minus infinity, psi is zero, that means minus v zero equal to c b v zero sine minus psi zero. I have just used the velocity equation velocity at t equals minus infinity was v0 and then I have put in the angular momentum term that is conserved so it doesn't matter where and then this is just psi is 0 so it's minus psi 0. So look at the picture at t equals minus infinity V, dr dt is v0 and psi is 0. This is minus psi 0. R is decreasing, so v, yes, R is the vector pointing, so that's V0. Um, and also from this equation, at the same boundary condition, you can get zero, so one of R is infinity, so it's zero is C cosine psi zero plus G. Let's call M1 plus M2 MT, V square, V zero square. I'm just putting in values into the two equations. So now you have uh, two equations for two unknown constants and you can solve both of them. And if you do it correctly, let's get rid of this. You get tangent of psi zero equal to minus V, V zero square over G M total. Okay. So essentially, you have solved for this phase angle at closest approach. What we are interested in is in the deflection angle and also the change in the velocity of this body because of this body. We're solving everything in the center of mass frame. That's why the individual velocities have not appeared yet. So we need a coordinate transformation at the end. So let's try to find out what theta is. Theta is two times psi zero minus pi.
This is coming from symmetry. So this part of the arc is exactly a mirror image for that part. Now, one thing that we are going to write down that will become kind of important and it will allow us to um, simplify the form, forms of the equations. Um, but first, let's uh, solve for theta. So theta becomes 210 inverse G M T over B V zero square. Okay. So now let's define a quantity called P ninety. So B ninety is the impact parameter at which for these masses the deflection angle will be 90 degrees. Yes. Uh, sorry? Mm. So this is dimensionless. Uh, G M over. So you, you need uh, a dimensionless quantity. So G M over length, and this is V square. So both are energy dimensions. So this should be okay. So if theta equals ninety, then you can write down or define this to be b for theta equals 90. That is g m t over v0 square. So if you replace these uh, g m t over v0 square here, it becomes 210 inverse b90 over b. So I want to pause here a little bit to talk about this form of this equation. So in any relaxed system, uh, a lot of these interactions are happening uh, throughout the lifetime of these stars. And essentially, each of these interactions are this kind of deflections. And this def from these deflections, you can calculate the change in velocity for these stars. And from that, you can calculate the uh, energy and angular momentum, so the integration, uh, integrals of motion. And if you do this for all stars as a result of all other stars, then you are essentially solving an n-body system. Okay? So that's what a direct n-body uh, code that takes into account each pairwise gravitational forces would solve. So that's what they are doing in any code. For us, uh, remember, we are not done yet. We need to find out what's the change in velocities for this thing. So let's write things down in... So as you can see, this is a planar problem, right? So everything is happening in the plane of the board. So you can write any velocity down as parallel to motion and perpendicular to motion. So let's do that. So from conservation of energy, so if you assume conservation of 
energy assume you can write down delta v perpendicular i'm still in the center of mass frame so when i move away from center of mass frame i will call them v1 and v2 okay that will become v0 sine theta that will become 2v0 v over b90 over 1 plus b squared over b90 squared and delta v parallel is v0 1 minus cosine theta equal to 2v0 over 1 plus b squared over b90 squared. This is just uh, algebra. So you can look at the geometry of theta and you can just break it into components. But in these equations, there is something really remarkable to find out. Okay? So remember, from this uh, discussion, we know that most of these interactions are happening at very large b, because most of the stars are very are distant. Okay. So in the limit b large, you can write down. Actually, yes, you, you can do it here, but let's do it in the individual stars frame because uh, that will be more useful to look at. So from these two, you can then do a coordinate transformation. V1 perpendicular. Sorry, one and parallel are kind of similar. So I just went from these two equations to the individual equations for one through this Cordian transformation. That's all I did. So that's actually what we were after from the beginning. So we wanted to see how the smooth velocity changes as a result of a deflection from another discrete star. So that's what we were after from the beginning. And that's what we have got already. So let's now think of limit B large. Then your delta V one perpendicular will be two G M two over B V zero. I just went to this equation. 
I have dropped one. This is B over B9, uh, B90 over B. And then I put in back uh, what B90 is. And that's what you've got. Okay. And you can write, also write down what's the V parallel for star one. But that's not that exciting because, you know, from symmetry, you know that uh, V parallel is dependent on this angle and it's always acting opposite of the motion because it's going away from the star at t equals plus infinity. So this will actually be 2 m2 v0 of mt times uh, b90 over b. b90 is g m t over v square. Ninety is the empty or v zero square over b. Two and two g v zero b. Same thing. It'll have to be the same thing because it's kind of symmetric problem. So in most of this kind of discreteness, this is the change in the velocity of every star that's moving in the field. Okay. So now we have solved it for uh, anything, in a single inter, uh, encounter at an impact parameter B. Okay. In a cluster, there will be a distribution of these discrete stars. So ultimately, we need to find out uh, what's the collective effect of all the stars and all the deflections. But before we do that, let's look at something quite remarkable. So. We have spent, what, like more, more than half an hour, almost one hour on this derivation. You could have come to something of this, this form just by looking at the symmetry of the problem. So you could have written down delta V. That is roughly whatever the acceleration is times whatever the time that the acceleration is acting upon it. So your acceleration is of order g m uh, over b square. And then let's say that it's acting for some symmetric B length of this thing. So this will be, that's the length divided by velocity is the acceleration. Uh, sorry, G over B, uh, Em over b square is roughly acceleration, and then 2b over v is the time. So then, do you get the right thing? So you get b, you get a 2. Yeah, you kind, yes, you do get the right thing. Sorry? No. So the, the, remember, these are all tildes. So we don't care about two. Yeah. 
So I kind of cheated. I knew that it's two, so I just said, okay, be this way, be that way. <clears throat> and you, you, you can, but in order of magnitude estimates, who cares about? Okay. Um, anything that's unclear up to here? So all I did is I put in B is large on these two equations. This second one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I messed up. Yeah, I think I again used the same thing. Thanks for catching this. It'll be something different. Yeah. But you, you can do it yourself. So let's now um, Uh, why strange? So, so the nice thing is it's exactly symmetric, right? So whatever is the gain in V parallel in this direction will be exactly opposite in the gain uh, loss in V parallel uh, on that. Yeah. <coughs> So now we want to find out statistically what happens when there are a lot of lots of these uh, deflections. Uh, what can I get rid of? Uh, yes, all of this is old. Thank you for correcting my mistake. So let's say we have a really large number of stars, okay? And within some spherical volume with R, okay? And then the geometry of the problem is this mass is moving with some velocity V and it sees all kinds of things in front of it. What we are asking is what's the total effect for all deflections within some impact parameter B. So it's essentially like a, a circular surface with radius B through which it's going in. Okay. So the number of such encounters will be some estimation of the density times 2 pi B, D, B, and this is, actually, there is no point in taking the volume density because it's actually a planar problem, right? So let's use a surface density as observed by the in-moving incoming star. That's roughly n times pi r square, okay? And as you can see that a star here will do exactly the opposite deflection to a star that's here. So just from symmetry, you can write down that the first moment is zero. Okay. 
but the second moment is not is not zero. Just from this, you can tell that whatever change happens to the orbit of the star that we are interested in happens on a longer time scale and in a diffusive manner. So this is definition of diffusion. Whenever your first moment is zero and second moment is non-zero. So kind so it's very similar uh, to a uh, random walk by some drunk person uh, where uh, steps in any direction is equally likely. So the expectation value of him or her moving in any direction is zero, but that person diffuses over a long time scale if it, if it takes many steps. It's exactly the same thing. It's as if any star moving in the smooth potential, seeing random stars, and doing a random walk. So let's try to calculate that, or estimate that. Um, exact estim estimation of this quantity depends strongly on the distribution function, uh, velocity of each star, and that's why you need to solve this numerically. But to do this on a board, uh, we are just going to use tildes and do dimensionally correct things. So this is roughly equal to your delta v square times delta n. So that's because if you have a small enough impact parameter, then you can just multiply all the delta v squares. This is 2gm over bv square times 2n over r square bdb. We just replaced delta n and did some algebra. So now you, to get a total delta v square, you need to integrate it over all b. Okay. So this is only at impact parameter b. You need to integrate it over all b. So let's call, let's put some reasonable limits. Okay, so the reasonable limits would be, uh, let's say, R, because we started from a distribution of stars within some volume of radius R. Now, what's the minimum limit? The minimum limit, let's call it B90. This is because if the deflection is very hard, then we want to resolve it in a different way. We are only interested in uh, small angle deflections. Uh, by the way, at B90, delta V is of order V. Okay? So we don't want such strong encounters. Uh, we will only restrict ourselves to larger Bs. And that's okay because we have already discussed and confirmed that most of these deflections are coming from really, really large impact parameters. So if you write that down, uh, so you have a BDB type thing, and there is a B square in the bottom. So you know that the integration will be of the form db over b, which will be a log. And if you use these uh, limits, so db over b, if you use these limits, it will become 
something, so the integrand will become something like ln r over b90. Okay. And oftentimes this is called ln lambda. So if you have solved uh, uh, distributions of charges, for example, uh, there also something like this comes up. Uh, this is often called Coulomb logarithm because this uh, in general comes for any distribution uh, that has a 1 over r square type force, um, nature of force. As soon as you have 1 over r square, whatever you do, this kind of integration will be of the form db over b. Yes. So these encounters are happening uh, instantaneously. Not, none of the masses are changing. Total mass of the object, yes. Yeah. That's a very good question. So B90 depends on the masses of the encounters involved, right? So in uh, real case scenarios where you have a distribution of masses as well as large number of stars, uh, and uh, you are integrating over billions of years, so that means the stars are evolving and their masses are changing. So for every time step you take, you recalculate B90 or equivalent for every pair. That's, that's the nature of the problem. Yes. That's why you need to do it computationally. Uh, there are ways to um, approximately solve this uh, that uh, that will we will discuss uh, in later classes. Uh, this is uh, the phase space picture, and we can we'll discuss that. But even there, uh, if stars are evolving um, and things are becoming unbound. Uh, it's not a correct solution. Yeah. So a subcluster in this context would be um, something that is contained within a bigger cluster. But stars from this will never interact with stars from that, and vice versa. And this is, um, well, when there were no computers back in Spitzer time, uh, this was an OK approximation to make, because uh, whenever uh, things get ejected from this subcluster, they move with such high velocity that if you calculate the probability that while it's getting removed from the whole system, what's the probability that it will encounter with another star? It's essentially zero. So you can treat these two systems separately and solve for the evaporation time of the inner system as if it's a gravitationally bound system in a potential. And in fact, Independent of subclustering, you always solve uh, any kind of gravitationally bound clusters in a larger potential. That potential would be the galaxy. If you do galaxy simulations, then again it's the same problem where the potential is of the halo. When you do galaxy cluster formation, it's again the same thing. It's 
some massive hollow conglomeration. So the nature of the problem is very similar, no matter uh, what length scale uh, you think about. So this kind of formalism is very powerful, actually. And so far, we have not talked about radii of stars. We only talked about masses. And we said that masses are not changing, at least in the time scale of this problem. So if you say that all stars are single and point mass, then this is a scale invariant problem. So you can, so length has no meaning, it's totally scalable, and time has no meaning, it's also totally scalable. Yes, yes. So all that matters is what's the total mass that's creating the potential. Um, of course, that's not reality. Uh, masses also change, and stars have radii, and stars often are found in binaries. So neither length nor time is scalable in real systems. I did not assume. That is evident because of the 1 over r square law. So remember, individual stars at a very far distance are indeed weakly interacting with the star. But there are simply more stars at far distances. And the way the, the, the fraction of more stars goes up exactly the same way as the force goes down. That's the uniqueness of this 1 over r square potentials. That's why the um, total influence of the, the other stars on this star does not change as a function of r. But here, we are interested in deflection due to one star. So of course, that's weak. Okay. Any other question before I move on? Okay, all good. So let's say so that is, we have already seen, uh, so this is roughly the form of delta V square. Okay? And delta V is zero. <coughs> so let's compare it with what is a typical V square. Okay? V square is of the order g times n times m over r. So in real systems, you will have an integration here. So it will be dn dm dm integrated over all m. Uh, but that's too much to write. So let's just write it dimensionally as n times mass per star. So to make it more accurate, you could write an average mass here. And this is the length of the volume. So R is of order G N M over V square. And delta V square is, so if you solve this integral, you will find there is something like 1 over, uh, hang on. I did step jump somewhere, looks like. Right. So delta V square would have been, yeah, I kept writing proportional things. Um, let's just not be lazy. It will be something like 8n gm over rv square. This is just solving for the constants. 
Okay, I thought I can just be lazy and skip it, but now I will need it. So that is 8n ln lambda. So delta v square over v square. Ah, lambda is 8n. Uh, lambda is just r over p90, okay? Does it make sense? Doesn't make sense. Uh, GNM over V square. What am I doing? Sorry? Ah, right. That's why it's not working. Uh, there is this constant, if you take this in here and then divide by v square, then it will become that. Yeah, when I did that, it felt like it's obvious. <laughs> right. So, trust me that this happens. Um, This may be incorrect, but it will definitely be of order log lambda over n. Now let's say that we are interested in a condition where delta v square over v square is of order one. So this is a situation where the smooth velocity Remember, this is the smooth velocity coming from the motion due to the smooth potential. This velocity is changing because of all this kicking around. That's this. So when these two of our order, the ratio of them of order one, that means that all the random fluctuations and deflections are equally important to that star as the smooth part of the potential, okay? So let's say, and of course, for each encounter, each typical encounter, delta V square is way less than Vs. Okay? That's what weak deflections really mean. Um, but there are many such deflections. So let's say after in our time of in our deflections, it acquires a delta v square that is of order v square. So n r would be equal to n times eight log lambda. And let's define another time, tr. That's the time it takes for nr deflections to happen. Okay. And so nr is the number of deflect. Uh, sorry, A nr is not the number of deflections it takes for this. Forget about that. I said it wrong, defined it wrong. NR is the number of such encounters per crossing time. So the star goes from one end of its orbit 
to another end of its orbit, or doesn't matter, completes the full orbit. Let's call it T cross, crossing time. And in one crossing time, this is the number of encounters it does. Let's say that TR is the time it takes for it to have a order one change in its smooth, smooth velocity. And then that will be in R times T cross. This is the number of crossing times, many crossing times. Okay. So that is n times 8 log lambda. And then we can write it as the size of the distribution divided by velocity. That's roughly the T cross. Okay. And then we can remember that lambda is essentially R over B90. So lambda is R over B90. RV square over GM. Uh, So then, this whole thing becomes uh, T relax of order. Oh, and uh, V also comes from here, right? So if you put uh, replace V from this equation uh, uh, in here, you can eliminate V completely, and you can get a form that looks like uh, of order 0 0.1 n over ln n time t crossing. This is actually 1 over 8. I just called it 0.1. Let's just Call it what it is. So what you are getting here is this TR is n over eight log n times the crossing time. Okay. And let's call this a relaxation time. Okay. So by relaxation here, I mean that in a relaxation time, a star will forget about its initial velocity. So that's in any kind of statistical mechanics type picture, that is called relaxation. So whatever its initial phase space was, it has completely changed after one to relaxation time. Let's look at some numbers very quickly. That will take just a minute. So I can now erase this part.
That's the definition. So, elliptical galaxies. These are some of the largest galaxies that we see. N is of order 10 to the 11. V is of order 200 kilometer per second. R is of order 20 kiloparsec. Assuming that you know what parsec is, and if you put in all the values there, you'll see that the crossing time is of order 10 to the 8 years. And the relaxation time is of order 10 to the 13 year. So very close to Hubble time. In case of globular clusters, Oh, yes, this is year, sorry, yeah. Much higher, much bigger than Hubble. Hubble yeah, 14 billion years is roughly the Hubble time. So for globular clusters, this is roughly 10 to the 5. R is roughly 10 per sec. And... V is roughly 10 kilometers per second. Then you can convince yourself that T relax is of order giga year, and T cross is of order one mega year. In, if I start using jargon, systems where that are not relaxed yet within its current age, these are often called collisionless systems. Here, collision is not really physical collision. Collision essentially means that this scattering, weak angle scattering things. And systems that have a relaxation time lower than its age are relaxed systems. And these are called collisional systems. All that really means is in these systems, after the first relaxation time, all stars phase space is ra completely randomized. Initial conditions don't matter. Uh, that's it for today. Any questions? Delta V square by V square order of one. So are we looking for how many uh, number of interactions it has to do to become, uh, to become so, delta V square uh, one? NR is the number of such interactions Par crossing time. So as the star goes from one end of its motion to the other end, so in some way you can think of a star going from one end of the galaxy to the other end of the galaxy. Uh, that's the crossing time. So let's say that there will be n r times these deflections. And then TR is essentially telling you what is the, no, 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 I am, yes, yes. So NR is the number of crossings it takes to get a order one change in its velocity. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Confusing him. 
Um, so this is the number of crossings it takes to get a order one change in velocity. And the time it takes to do nr number of crossings is nr times t cross. From that, uh, it follows that relaxation time is related to the crossing time just as a function of the n. And for typical n in galaxies and global clusters, galaxies are relaxed, uh, non-relaxed, and global clusters are relaxed. So V square is uh, kinetic energy. So this is fine because this is ener uh, kinetic energy per unit mass. This is also this is potential energy per unit mass. So dimensionally, this is correct. Lambda became order n because uh, I have erased it. Lambda is this, right? So this is r over b90. And I put in uh, what b90 is. And then I'm saying that uh, in a virial system, this, this must be the, roughly what the v is. Right? So from by replacing B90 and then connecting V with N, you can evaluate and uh, lambda becomes of order N. It's not. It's only valid for really large N. This is, remember, this is a mean field, right? So you are assuming that the main motion is in the smooth potential. So if there doesn't exist a smooth, smooth potential, then the whole analysis is wrong. So the basic assumption of the formalism is there exists a smooth potential, and stars usually follow its trajectory in that potential. It diverts from its trajectory occasionally, when it finds a star that is close enough to create a deflection that matters. So that's the picture. So for example, if you want to do this for two-body systems, then it will be very wrong. So the solution in the two-body system is uh, Keplerian motion. So. Um, the system can be relaxed or not, but it has to be large enough n so that uh, you can consider this as a uh, smooth put. So this is a relaxed system, OK? If you think in terms of mean free path, uh, taking analogy from ideal gas, for example, then the mean free path for 
this relax system is roughly 1,000 crossings. That's what this equation is all about. So this equation is telling you that for large N systems, this whole analysis is valid only when a typical mean free path is many, many crossing times. This will break down uh, during these movies that I was, showing, I was showing you. So stars that come so close to each other they, that they interact uh, within a crossing time. And then you have to in, uh, include other physics. So if you remember in one of my slides, uh, there were two separate headings. One was two-body relaxation. So this is two-body relaxation. Relaxation due to two-body forces. There was a separate heading that was strong encounters. So strong encounters are encounters where a single encounter can create large angle deflections. For example, that binary single star scattering. But the rate of these strong encounters is typically low. And it's proportional to the local density. But in clusters and in centers of galaxies, you can have densities that are so high that some stars will always have a high enough probability to interact strongly. So if you want to write a code that can do, uh, that can solve this problem properly, then in addition to this two-bot relaxation, you also need to include strong encounters. Yes. It's not. Uh, by doing the hard work. <laughs> um, I will come to that uh, in the next, next lecture. Yes. Um, the way you can tell is uh, from... Okay, let's think about it. So all you see, let's, let's say that you are looking at a star cluster. So all you see is the total light in several different filters. Right? So let's say you are looking through Hubble, it has many different filters. You choose two filters to look at, one in blue, one in visible. Um, and then you look at the, all, all the stars that you can resolve. And then you can draw something. So let's keep it separate from these equations. Let's say you have watched in these two bands. And these are the two axes, and you plot every star that you have. It looks like this. This is called a color magnitude diagram, if you have seen one. This is called a main sequence, and then they become giants. There can be some other weird stars. There can be some binaries. Well, I'm calling them weird, but we actually know how they are created. And then there is a horizontal branch, and then they come, and these are the white dwarf cooling sequence. And then you have neutron stars and black holes that you don't see. So once you have this, and you have the values of this B minus V, you can model your stellar evolution uh, so, from stellar evolution models, you can draw isochrons. So, if I have a bunch of stars evolving 
starting from same t equals zero, how will my uh, distribution look like on this plane? So these are called isochrons, meaning at any given time. So by fitting that isochron to the color magnitude diagram, you can tell roughly what is the age of the thing is. Actually, it's a two-dimensional problem. You can play with the metallicity as well as the edge. And the details of exactly what this angle is, how many on the horizontal branch, etc. these things change uh, due to combinations of time and metallicity. From that, you can get time and metallicity. So, edge. Now, from the total light, you know that so most of the light is coming from the main sequence stars, so bright things, right? Uh, and then you assume that mass to light ratio is some constant, which is actually not true, but turns out that for uh, uh, globular clusters, it's roughly around two. For galaxies, it's several hundreds. That's because of dark matter, but that's a separate question. So once you assume some mass to light ratio, then from the total light, you know what the mass is. And then because you know what's the lifetime in the main sequence for stars of different masses, uh, and you know the edge, you know which masses are contributing to the light. So from that, you can uh, tell what is the average mass of the cluster is, stellar mass. From that, you get an estimate of the number of stars. So once you know the number of stars, oh, and then you need to calculate another thing that is called the surface brightness profile. So this is, say, some luminosity in some filter per area. And this is distance from the center. And let's say both are log. Then it looks kind of like that. From this, you can find out what, how compact the distributions of stars are in a cluster. Combining all of this, you can infer whether it will be a relaxed system or not. Uh, also, you can infer up to what radius it's relaxed. 